UNC basketball icon Eric Montross was a legend, and not just because of his exploits on the basketball court, but more importantly, because of the man that he was off it. We remember today the life of Eric Montross. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, December 19th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you, in particular you everydayers, for joining us to make Locked On Tar Heels your first listen or watch to get your team every day. Today, coming up on the show, as I said off the top, unfortunately, we got the news on Monday that Eric Montross had passed away Sunday, uh, surrounded by his loved ones, and if, if you have to leave this earth, that's how you want to go. So we're going to talk about that tragic news, celebrate his life, um, and then want to look back at some other things that we didn't get to on Monday's show, looking back at the Kentucky game from Saturday. So we'll do all that. By the way... Coming up on Friday's show, I'd like to dedicate some time on the show to sharing some stories from those of you out there listening or watching specifically related to Eric Montross. It might have been an encounter you had with him. It might have been a basketball memory. It might have been a time that you were, you know, just had a brush with him, whatever it is. We'd love to be able to share some of those on Friday's show. If you'd like to share one of those, we'd love you to do it. Here's two ways you can do that. Join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord channel, and we've got a mailbag or Discord chat. We've got a mailbag channel in there, and you can just drop your story into there, or you can email it, lockedontarheels at gmail.com. Those are the best two ways to do it. If you want to include a picture or something, please feel free to do so, and we'll put that on the video version. Since it is Tuesday, we always have Tuesday trivia, and I thought it would only be appropriate if our trivia question was related to the man known as Big Grits in recent years. Here it is. And as always, we'll ask the question now and then answer it at the end of the show. Only two players in North Carolina history have ever won, ever worn, excuse me, double zero. Eric was one of them. Your answer, the question you need to answer is, who was the other? Bonus points and the tougher part, there are six players who have worn a, the single zero. Name them. So seven potential players to name. The one other non-Eric Montrose to wear double zero and the six players who have worn zero. So um, some details. Eric Montrose died Sunday night, 52 years old. He had been diagnosed with cancer back in March. So this thing, guys, nine months, nine months. I know so many of our lives and families have been ravaged by this terrible disease, cancer. Um, And it doesn't make it any easier. And it's happened to so many of us. But I think so many people felt like they were a part of Eric or that he was a part of them because of how big of a man he was. And I mean that both in height and in personality. And you know what I mean when I say that. And so today, we just want to spend some time thinking about him. Um, Leaves behind family, his wife, Laura, and they mentioned their three children, Sarah, Andrew, Megan. You know things of of all of Eric's basketball exploits. We'll talk more about those in a second. But, you know, more importantly, the the humanitarian work he did, things like his Father's Day camp to to benefit research and uh, just, just other things. You know, there's the famous story of, Uh, Luke May going off to the Children's Hospital the day after his shot against Kentucky. Who was it that had initially set up that relationship? Eric Montra. Like those kind of things are what we remember. Yes, he was a great basketball player. Yes, he was a great color man, great, um, you know, basketball mind and basketball talker, passionate Tar Heel, loved his university. But I think critically important is the fact that he was an even better human being, an even better man. And this is often said of people at the time of their death. But with Eric, it legitimately is extremely legitimately true. Adam Lucas, as he always does, wrote a very great article. If you haven't read it, you should go read it uh, about his friend um, whom he had spent the greater part of the last two decades with traveling to and from Carolina basketball games. 
in the subtitle of his article, I thought, you know, I don't know if Adam put this subtitle on it or the editors did or whatever, but it just said, Eric Montross left a legacy of stories, very few of which involved basketball. And that's it. Is, is that what not what any one of us would want said of us at our death? Regardless of the thing that it is we're known for in life, whether it's basketball like this or acting or success in business or minister or teacher, whatever it is that people know you for, at the end of the day, it's our humanity that sets us apart and is what people remember, how, how you made them feel or what you were like with them in relationship. And Eric was one of those people for whom that reality is true, that the thing he's known for globally is basketball. But the stories that are told, as Adam so well pointed out in his article, are the stories of who Eric is. And man, i that's what we're all striving for. Now, make no mistake, let's not mitigate what a ridiculous basketball player Eric was. Like, to, to do so is, is to miss the mark. But that when I'm making this statement to say as good of a basketball player he was, he was that much better of a man. That's not lowering his basketball capability. That's saying this dude was an absurd basketball player, but that's what makes what we're saying about Eric the Persian all the more impressive. You know what I mean? Now, I personally never had the pleasure of like shaking Eric's hand and saying hi. I had many brushes past him and at my time talking about Tar Heels stuff. You know, I because of where I live, I don't get to cover Carolina in person very often, but the the few things I've been at. I've, I've been by him or brushed by him. I told the story last week of um, when we were in Memphis for the Sweet 16 and Elite 8 weekend. And uh, just I have a picture that pops up on my TV every now and then of just being a few feet away from Eric and just like, goodness, you're a tall human being. He truly was larger than life. A statement from the Montrose family that Carolina basketball put out reads this way, quote, the family of Eric Montross, Laura, Sarah, excuse me, Laura, Sarah, Andrew, Megan, is announcing that he passed away on Sunday, December 17th, surrounded by loved ones at his home in Chapel Hill. Eric was diagnosed with cancer in March 2023, and his family is grateful for the tremendous support and the truly overwhelming love expressed by so many people as he battled with his signature determination and grace. They also thank the many members of the medical community and particularly those at UNC Lineberger Cancer Center, who matched his fight with equal passion. To know Eric was to be his friend, and the family knows that the ripples from the generous, thoughtful way that he lived his life will continue in the lives of the many people he touched with his deep and sincere kindness. The family asks for privacy during this difficult period, end quote. Ah, man, I, that's just beautiful and so true. And so, uh, you know... If you ever are with the show, you know me to be a person of faith, a Christian. And so I've stopped multiple times throughout Monday and, and continue to do so to pray for Eric's family, to pray for those who have been so close to him. Um, it's interesting. We're in a season right now called Advent, uh, where we look towards the coming of Jesus, the, the hope, peace, joy, and love that Jesus brings. Right now we're in the week where we look specifically at joy. We've just finished the week on peace. So I, I've been praying for peace to reign over the Montrose family, but also joy. Now, folks, what's the difference between joy and happiness? Happiness is something that can be taken away from you, uh, just like sadness can be taken and, and then you return to happiness. But joy, as we experience it, is something that has an even so quality. It, it cannot be changed or moved. But there is a joy and a hope that we have, and uh, th that has been my prayer throughout the day for the Montross family. In terms of Eric's basketball stuff, at North Carolina, the leading scorer on the 93 National Championship team. He won one national championship, another Final Four, a Sweet 16, couple ACC championships, two-time consensus second team All-American, made the first team All-ACC in 93, second team in 94, was coach, one of Coach Davis's teammates his last two, Coach Davis's last two years for his career averaged 11.7 points, 6.8 boards, shot 58 and a half percent from the field, played 139 games. I mean, just one of those iconic Carolina careers. 
Um, and kind of neat for me, like my first memories of North Carolina basketball are I, yeah, I'm about to turn 40, like in a month. So that kind of gives you some frame of reference was I was spending the night at a buddy's house, the night of the 93 championship game. And that's one of my first memories of, of the Tar Heels and watching this mountain of a man go to work. Um, as far as the NBA, ninth overall selection by the Celtics in the 94 draft, played for the Celtics, Mavs, Nets, 76ers, Pistons, and Raptors, averaged four and a half points and 4.6 boards in his career. Just got to levels in this sport that not many people do. And I think another part of what makes Eric's basketball skills phenomenal is that he's not impressed. Eric wasn't impressed by Eric from all accounts, right? This is obviously not firsthand knowledge. And man, that just says so much to me. He's one of a handful of people to have ever done this at the level that he did. But what matters more to him were people and those he surrounded himself with and, and how we are in community. And folks, that's what we're trying to build here at Locked on Tar Heels. And so like Eric is typifies what we are trying to be as the Locked on Tar Heels community. And I love that. By the way, think, thinking ahead to Wednesday night, this just adds another kind of interesting layer to the Oklahoma game because you just think about the, the heavy hearts and the way that people are processing this. I mean, the head coach of the Tar Heels, having just lost one of his teammates, uh, that's going to be a very real and raw thing come Wednesday night. Hopefully the Tar Heels can use that to channel it in a healthy way um, to, to remember this man that has sat on the sidelines and called their games. That, obviously not this year. So for the newcomers, they didn't experience that. But for the four returners, obviously they did. Two other quick things about Eric, and then we'll move on. The great news to me is that it's not us now saying Eric Montross had a great impact on the community and the world. Now, that is true. But what's neat is that we can confidently say that Eric Montross, even posthumously, will continue to have a lasting legacy and impact because of the man that he was and the lives that he changed. Going back to Adam Lucas's article, and, and this will round it off our, our conversation today on Eric, there's a line that stood out to me and said this, quote, so understand this, Eric cared deeply about being a Tar Heel and about Tar Heel basketball and about Carolina as a whole. It's just that he realized way before the rest of us that life continued when the lights turned off in the Smith Center. And that's good, end quote. And here's how I then process that. The lights now may be off for Eric, but life goes on. Life goes on worse because Eric is no longer in this world. But life also goes on better because he was in this world. Thank you, Eric Montross, for your example. The man that you were, we're grateful. Again, if you have stories about Eric Montross that you'd like to share, you can hop into the Locked on Tar Heels Discord to share that in the mailbag channel or email us lockedontarheels at gmail.com. Com. Well, we do want to get back to the Kentucky game. Some, some other things to kind of wrap up from that to go back to and talk about. And we'll do that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights and more, whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your part every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're not burning cash, you're burning rubber. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. Okay, we want to get back into the Kentucky 
gain. Um, but insofar as I, I want to look at one other thing kind of surrounding it first, and then we'll dive into it. So the new AP poll came out on Monday, as it does every Monday, and we learned that the Tar Heels actually only fell two spots to 11. I think that says something about both. We talked about this last week when the new poll came out. It says something about both what the national media thinks about the Tar Heels, but also I think what the national media thinks about Kentucky, that these are two of the top 15-ish teams in the nation, and that losing to one another, especially in a tight score like this, isn't that big a deal, right? Uh, and, and I, I appreciate that we've kind of evolved our thinking on that. But uh, also as part of this AP poll, we learned that Kentucky, uh, excuse me, Oklahoma is going to be ranked when Carolina plays them on Wednesday night. Oklahoma is currently seventh. So here's what this means. It is a historical moment, a truly historical scheduling moment for North Carolina. The AP poll began back in 1948 49. Since that time, North Carolina has never played five ranked AP ranked teams in a span of six regular season games until now. That changes on Wednesday. If you know me, you know I like to do research to look at stats and, and history and, and go back on stuff. And so I got to looking at this when it looked like Oklahoma was actually playing good basketball. I was like, let me go back and check this out because this is a lot of ranked teams in a, a short you know, span of games. So I started looking back, you know, started at 1948, 49 season when the AP poll got going, just 20 teams ranked at that point. Just kept working my way back up to the present and literally never has the Tar Heels done this. I researched it. I promise like went back over it three, four times and it became official with that new AP poll on Monday. Carolina will play five AP ranked teams in six games. So it started with the last game of Battle for Atlantis. Arkansas was ranked 20th, then Tennessee 10th, then Florida State, who wasn't ranked. That's the outlier. Then UConn was 5th, Kentucky was 14th, and Oklahoma 7th. So not only is it, you know, a bunch of ranked teams, four of the five were ranked in the top 15 at the time Carolina played them. And Kentucky, who was 14th, is now in the top 10. So, I mean, this is a ridiculous schedule. And don't forget, after <clears throat> Oklahoma, excuse me, Carolina plays Charleston Southern, but then they kick off ACC play, or the main chunk of ACC play, with three road games in tough locations at Pitt, at Clemson, who's playing ridiculous basketball, and at NC State. So, this is wild it's nuts. You know, Mac Brown talked about how difficult the football schedule was. Y'all, this thing is no joke right here. So buckle up because it's going to still be crazy. And, and another part of this um, that, that I want to take away from the Kentucky game is that all season long, including Kentucky, Carolina has continued to be tough and to fight. And not only like, it, it's not just response. That's what we've hoped for from Carolina in the past. If you listened at all to John Calipari's John Calipari's post-game press conference, he talked about look, look, essentially Carolina was the aggressor in this game, and we were just trying to meet them. Yo, that is what I want to hear about this college basketball team, the North Carolina Tar Heels. That they are going out and being the team to try to punch the other teams in the mouth and be tougher. Now, it didn't necessarily show up in the on the scoreboard Saturday because obviously Kentucky was the team that built out an early lead, got it to double digits. But then not only was Carolina tough enough to be an aggressor, they were tough enough to fight back, as we talked about on Monday, get that halftime deficit down to two. And by the way, they had a look to get it tied or, or even be up one at the break, which is bonkers to think about. And then in the second half, obviously, they got down kind of double digits again, fought all the way back and actually took a lead on two Armando Baycott free throws. Now, it was very short-lived, less than 20 seconds, but they did it. And then it, it's true of all three losses. I know the UConn one was by 11, but they, they kept fighting, even against this team that, look, the more I've seen of UConn, that team is so good. They they just did work on Gonzaga last Friday night. I mean, it's UConn's load. I moved them all the way up to number two in my poll, just behind Purdue. And so, um, and then the other loss to Villanova. And I know that one's not as good, but that was another physical team. Carolina never gave up. They could have, um, and it just didn't end with a W. And and frankly, even some of the games that 
could have been losses that turned into wins. Carolina kept fighting, never gave up. Florida State game is a great example of that. But now here's where we're at with it. Number one, I'd like to see Carolina play better out of the gate and not get into these holes. Like, I, I love the fight. I love the comebacks. And I know that that's just part of the deal. Sometimes you're going to have to do that. But I'd like to see Carolina continue to get You know, we talked about with Kentucky, that that four-minute uh, gap or uh, time of play until the first media timeout. I want to see Carolina, like, blitz it right there, kind of like the Tennessee game where they just – dominated that first half. That's what I want to see more of. Because if Carolina hadn't done that, they lose that Tennessee game based on what happened with Dalton Connect in the second half. If Carolina had blitzed the first half against Kentucky, I think they win that basketball game. So, number one, don't get in these holes in the first place. Number two, I, I want to move now from don't just not give up. I want to move now to completing it. If you're ahead, get further ahead. That's holding a team down when you've got a lead. If you're behind a little, catch up a little and then take a lead and then build it out. If you're behind by a lot, like Carolina was multiple times on Saturday against Kentucky, just keep chipping away. Good things happen if you just hang around and hang around. We've seen it. How many times where the Tar Heels are letting a team keep hanging around? You're like, you got to pull away. You got to pull away or this team's going to get confident and bad things can happen. So I, I I love this Carolina team. It's like me as a Braves fan. I past couple years, I have never felt like the Braves are out of any game because they just keep coming at you in waves offensively. That's what I want teams to feel like when they play this Tar Heels team. That if, if we don't execute at the ex- complete capacity of what we're capable of as a team, we will not win this game because Carolina will fight for 40 minutes. That's what I need the Tar Heels to do. Okay, good stuff there. Now, a couple more things I want to talk about. Number one was there was, there was some consternation about Coach Davis putting Elliot Cadeau back into the game for that uh, final key offensive possession on Saturday. I disagree with a lot of it, and I think it was the right call. And I'd like to talk about that and a couple other little things in just a second. Okay, on Saturday, you might recall that um, coming down the stretch, Carolina's down three. It's that that moment where there's really just not much time left on the clock. I think it was, what, 11 seconds or so by that point. Let me get back to it, and we can tell you so I'm making sure I'm not feeding you false information. Um, Carolina's down three, uh, five, five seconds by the time Elliot threw the turnover. And so um, there's a lot of, I saw a lot of like, why was Elliot Cadeau back in? Why, you know, he'd been out for a long time. Why are you putting him in in that situation when you'd had a good thing going with some other guys? I think it's the right call. I'd, I'd like to kind of base this off of a tweet I saw from one of the other major groups that covers Carolina athletics. And it said this, quote, Cadeau passed the ball to Ryan's back as he was running up the court. He hadn't been in since the 906 mark because he'd struggled. Hubert instead insert or excuse me, Hubert inserted the freshman and he made a crucial mistake, end quote. All right. Some of this is fact. But some of this is a take that I just disagree with. Particularly and specifically, uh, he he hadn't been in since the 906 mark because he'd struggled. Now, was this Elliot Cadeau's best game of his career? Absolutely not. But I think because he would struggled takes it a bit far. Like as I read through the comments of this and saw some of the 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 replies back, you know, there was the reply to the tweet and then the original there was a reply to it. So one of the pushbacks, for example, was, well, Elliot was minus 14 on plus minus or whatever. Okay. Harrison Ingram was minus 15, one worse. So I guess Harrison Ingram shouldn't have been in this game either. If if that's the logic we're using. Nope. Don't buy that. Uh, maybe you're saying that he struggled with turnovers. Well, to this point, he had one turnover in this entire game. So if that's your argument, then Armando Baycott shouldn't have been in the game because he had six. RJ Davis shouldn't have been in the game because he had five. 
No, that's not true. He didn't struggle with turnovers. Didn't struggle with shooting because he only took two of them and he made one. Now, you'd probably like to see Elliot Cadeau get more shots. And perhaps that was a struggle in this game. I can buy some of that 100%. Also, the phrasing of this tweet makes it all, all kind of come down on Elliot. Like, um, I know Cormac was going down to set a screen for RJ, who's coming up the sideline to get a, you know, hopefully be able to get that game tying three look at least off. But go back and watch it some. Cormac turned his head probably to look to see, you know, just the timing of things. But to my eye, he, if he's going to turn his head at all, he's got to be ready for the potentiality that Elliot might throw it to him. Maybe Elliot saw something. He's like, I don't know that RJ can get free. He did, but you know, you just don't know. And so, yes, to me, the majority of the blame for this is on Elliot, but it cannot all be on Elliot. Uh, some of that Cormac has to take as well. Um, and ultimately, to me, it I, I think a better thing to have said would have been he hadn't been in since the 906 mark because of foul trouble. Because he had four fouls. He'd been sitting on the bench. Now, again, I'm not, not saying he didn't struggle. Again, it wasn't his best game. But I don't think that was the critical reason he had been in. And this was a crucial mistake. But it's just one error in a series of errors that th this particular play shouldn't have had to matter. Carolina should have been able to take care of business otherwise. But what I like about Elliott being in for this play, I think it's the right call. It allows RJ to be off the ball because when RJ was the primary ball handler on the previous possession, or maybe it was two possessions prior, Kentucky swarmed him and he couldn't do anything. It wound up in Harrison Ingram's hands and he got to the free throw line. Utilizing your best playmaker in just like, you just got to get one offensive possession right and get a three in. And RJ has been on fire. So yeah, I'm going with Elliot for this one moment every time of the way. Like where he was getting kind of abused was on defensive switches. That doesn't even matter right now. This is one offensive possession. So again, I, I disagree with um, this, this idea that Coach Davis made the wrong call by putting in Elliot for this final offensive, final critical offensive possession. No. I don't buy it. Um, but speaking of bench usage, speaking of plus minus with Elliot being at minus 14, any idea without looking at the box score, who had the best plus minus for the Tar Heels in this game? I'll just tell you right now, I would not have gotten, I would not have guessed this correctly. It's Jalen Withers had a plus 13 in a game where the majority of the starters are at negative whatever. Seth Trimble was second with plus 10. And yes, these are the two guys the two subs that had the most minutes played. But, oh, I don't know. If your team is struggling against a longer, lengthier, rangier, more athletic opponent, maybe that's part of why your longer, rangier, more athletic players like Jalen Withers and like Seth Trimble are having the best success in this game and, and ultimately wind up with the best plus minus. I, I just would have liked to have seen even more minutes from those two guys. And I know like with Seth, there's some offensive limitations. I know with Jalen, as we've talked about, like he's not doing great right now, but in this game against this Kentucky team, I think we needed a couple more minutes of those two dudes. Heck get Zayden, Zayden high out there because of his motor athleticism, get a Conco out there just for a couple minutes. Let him, let him, Banging the post with the Aaron Bradshaw, who's who's slender a little bit, you know. Let just use those fouls that a Conquo has. I would have liked to have seen that with the bench usage. And then here's the last thing: Aaron Bradshaw's phantom fifth foul. <laughs> uh, there, there was a lot of talk about Mondo had done a great job drawing fouls three and four early in the second half on Bradshaw. And then there was this play with about 5.15 to go where Cormac Ryan had just airballed a three. Mondo gets the rebound. A foul is called on Kentucky as Baycott's going back up. And it's assessed to Dillingham. On the broadcast, they think in real time and initially that it's going to go to Bradshaw. And so there was all of this. Did they make the right call? 
giving it to Dillingham because also Aaron Bradshaw played several critical roles down the stretch with offensive rebounds, putbacks, getting to the free throw line, things of that nature, you know, bothering shots just with his presence. So I went back and I watched this play over and over and over again in real time, sped up time, quarter time speed is where I looked at it the most. And here's what I saw. As soon as Armando gets the offensive rebound off the air ball, Mondo rebounds it to go back up. There's a good deal of contact underneath from Bradshaw, and there's a reach in from Rob Dillingham. So the questions are what contact came first, which ref gets to make that call. And if there's simultaneous contact, probably you go with the most egregious, right? So here's what I saw from Bradshaw that basically as soon as Mondo comes down with the rebound, Bradshaw fouls him. A little bit of time goes by as Mondo spins, uh, Bradshaw fouls him on the shoulder. He gets his shoulder. And then only after that does Dillingham reach in. And from all the camera angles, it's tough to tell, you know, how much of an impact that even makes. It's just like, like I don't even know for sure that he touched his body. But then as Mondo goes up, Bradshaw lifts his hands, doesn't have any kind of verticality. I mean, it's clearly like uh, a roof kind of situation and he's fouling Mondo again. The problem is all three refs whistle a foul. Fisk goes up indicating it. It is the the majority for watching the, the two camera angles, the one from the wing, it's hard to tell. And you really only see Dillingham's reach in because Baycott's kind of shielding off Bradshaw's body. But from under the basket, you see all of that contact from Aaron Bradshaw clearly and plainly. But since it, and, and you don't get to see this on the broadcast, but it looks like the ref that's out on the wing is the one adjudicating this call down in the post. So he goes over and delivers the number to the scorer's table. And since he was out on the wing, sees the Dillingham contact, not as much the Bradshaw contact. And I get it. Like these calls are made sometimes, but I would have liked to have seen the refs get together, talk about it and then decide, okay, it's this guy. Now, you don't have some of the same rules as in the NBA where you can challenge who a foul is on. Although even in the NBA, you can only challenge it if it's a foul called on your player. I can't say, oh, that call on Kentucky, whatever. That That's not a thing. So all of this matters because Bradshaw had an impact. Would it have changed things if he was on the bench with five fouls and it's Onyenso that's in or Trey Mitchell at the five? I don't know. There, there's no way you can say for certain but it had an impact. However, here's what I got to say. At the same time, as the same thing with the Elliott Cadeau thing, if you make have already made better plays down the stretch, not had 17 turnovers, not had, you know, all th however many, 13 offensive rebounds, I can't even remember now. I'm not looking at the box score anymore. Like, then then it doesn't matter. You, you've beaten Bradshaw. And so I, I'm happy to, like, be the voice of complaint here, but also I'm happy to be the voice of, Make that play not matter by being better at other moments. I, I think that is the bigger takeaway here, even though I think it was Bradshaw's fifth foul. All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. Coming up tomorrow on uh, Wednesday show, Coach Pat Kilby and I are going to get you ready for this all-important game against Oklahoma on Wednesday. And then on Thursday show, Coach Rob and I are going to break it down. We're going to record late Wednesday night after the game um and so we'll have all that coming at you and as i said on friday's show would love to be able to share some more of your eric montross stories if you would be so kind as to share them would love to be able to do that you can join the discord if you're not already in there drop it in there would love to have you you can email the show locked on tar heels at gmail.com also don't forget to subscribe to the show on audio or video Smash the like button so we were no, we know you were here. We'd love it if you would rate and review the show. Five stars, talk about why you love it. And then also, leave your comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts on, on Big Grits passing away and then the Kentucky-Carolina game from Saturday. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel, even when we're struggling and grieving together. But we're reminded of how great this community is. We'll talk again tomorrow. But until then...